class. Now, it's real hard for modern Americans to get their heads wrapped around grass. Because for most of us, the only thing we know about grass is it grows in the lawn and we have to mow it every week. I mean, that's our whole, you know, knowledge of grass. But actually, there are lots of varieties of grass, and if you let these native grasses grow, they will grow more abundantly than you can imagine. Do you, how many of you have ever read the Little House on the Prairie books? Laura Ingalls Wilder. All the girls raise their hand. All right. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, you remember when they started the, um, moving out into the to the prairie, and uh, they were they wouldn't let the girls go outside because they were afraid they'd lose them. <clears throat> the first settlers, when uh, Virginia's governor Spotswood, go back to your Virginia history, those of you who are in Virginia, when Governor Spotswood, this is before the American Revolution, okay. Uh, commissioned his Knights of the Golden Horseshoe. And they started this big expedition from Williamsburg to scout out what lay to the west of Charlottesville, which wasn't really anything but a hamlet. And they, climbed, they, they, they went over Afton Mountain, they dropped down into the valley, and in their diaries, those... Knights of the Golden Horseshoe wrote their families, some of them even in Europe, and said, we rode all day, and everywhere we rode, we could tie the grass in a knot above the horse's saddle. Okay? I mean, um, one of the most uh, almost religious experiences I ever had was when I spoke at the uh, University of Nebraska in Lincoln. And they have preserved, the University of Nebraska, they preserved a one-acre native prairie in its pristine condition. They burn it once a year to maintain it. And you can walk out in there and literally this grass is higher than eight feet tall and the stems are, are a half inch in diameter. It's, it's, it's indescribable. And to imagine miles and miles of that waving. I mean, it, it, it'll make you get chill bumps. It's unbelievable. The biomass, the sheer biomass, the carbon that that's producing. And that, folks, the, the centuries of that biomass development are what we are today mining in our corn, soybean, cotton, uh, wheat culture. We are still today living on that. So, what we want to do here is this hay is grass that's solar dried. That's biomass. That's carbon. Okay? And a and hundred pounds of that is only five pounds of soil and 95 pounds of sunlight. That's an astounding thing. It means that every day, if we handle our carbon correctly, the planet should be gaining weight every day. All right? I mean, that's a powerful thought, that, that if you pick up that bale of hay at 100 pounds, 95 pounds of it is just sunlight. Okay? Now, in the wintertime, the soil goes to sleep around here. It's hibernating. And of course the soil has a whole community of Actinomycetes, Mycorrhizae, Gymerillans, Azidobacter. I mean, there are more organisms in a double handful of healthy soil than there are people on the face of the earth. And if you look at them under an electron microscope, it's more dr it makes Steven Spielberg look like a like a kindergartner. You know, you look at there, and there's this, you know, this four-legged, big gold fat, you know, thing, blob. You know, he comes in, in, in the electron microscope, you know, at one o'clock, bloop, bloop, he's walking along. And then all of a sudden, here comes in from, from eight o'clock, uh, a six-legged, 
you know, uh, a narwhal-looking thing with a spear out his front end. He punctures into the edge of that, boop, 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 you know, <laughs> and juice flies everywhere. And he, you know, he, he desiccates the thing right in front of your eyes. But before the thing even hits the ground, from from uh, four o'clock, here comes another, uh, you know, six-legged critter. And he comes galloping in to the field of vision in the electron microscope. Comes along, he's got big uh, pinchers in the front of his head. You know, he comes up and whack, locks off the loop, loop, loop head, you know, and eats it. This is going on in the soil. This is, this is, there is more, there is more life, more physical community happening in this unseen world than the world we see. That has profound spiritual implications. In that the world that we don't see on a daily basis is actually more real and sustaining the world that we see. Right? Now, in the winter, these critters go to sleep. They're hot, they're, you know, it's too cold. They, 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 they go into dormancy for either too cold or uh, too dry. All right? These cows are dropping 50 pounds of nutrients out their back end every day. 50 pounds. Now, it is highly soluble. It's also uh, uh, very oxidizable. All right? The hard thing is to, is to, is to, to get your hands around it because it wants, to, it wants to vaporize. We all know what that smells like. It wants to leach into the groundwater and go to the Chesapeake Bay. It, it's very unstable in its raw state. And so what we want to do is tie it down chemically with carbon, what I call a carbonaceous diaper, all right, so that... And carbon, of course, carbon wants to attach to everything. Carbon's the other thing. Carbon is extremely stable. You can put a lump of carbon, you know, that hay, you can put that lump of hay on your table in your house, and it could stay there for a hundred years and not change a lick. Carbon's very stable. So this carbon that wants to latch on to things chemically bonds with this highly soluble unstable nutrient coming out of the back end of the cow and so this bedding just builds so we just let this build through the winter okay and these feed boxes here are on pulleys all right see the hand winch down there i can just turn that winch and these feed boxes i can just winch them right on up so as this bedding pack as this diaper builds in thickness through the winter with this with this stable carbonaceous uh, um, uh, you know, nutrient dense material as it builds, we just keep lifting the boxes to accommodate the bedding buildup. It's not very deep now because we just started feeding the cows um, about 10 days ago. Uh, but this will build on up and it'll, it'll come on, it'll get up to four feet deep, uh, depending on how long you feed. This year it won't be probably more like three feet. Anyway, it gets real deep, it gets, gets on up here. And, um, the cows, of course, are trumping out the oxygen, so it's anaerobic. It's fermenting, um, and, it's, and it, so it stays warm. It never freezes. You know, even when it's cold, it, you know, it's nice and warm. And uh, again, you notice there's you know, uh, 120 head of cattle right here. Um, what do you smell? Nothing. Okay? Because the volatile nutrients are being captured by the carbon. So we let this build, we add corn to it. We've already put in a uh, 1,000 pounds of corn down in this side over here. That corn is fermenting in that bedding pack. The cow hooves are tromping it up in there. In the spring then, when the grass begins to grow again, the cows come out, and we go in here with the piggerators. All pigs have a sign on their forehead, we'll work for corn. <laughs> And the pigs then go in seeking this fermented corn, and in the process, they churn, aerate, okay, oxygenate, and convert this from anaerobic to aerobic compost. And we haven't had to do any of it. The pigs do all the work. 
So we don't have to buy $20,000 compost turners. We don't have to run any petroleum. The pigs don't need their oil changed. They don't need spare parts.